Welcome to the COVID lectures. Wait, that's that's kind of misleading. Oh. Welcome to the We Had to Change Our Teaching Format because of COVID lectures. Okay, all jokes aside, hopefully you guys are safe and you're well. Uh, we are going to continue with the math because, you know, no rest for the weary. We got to be out here still grinding, uh, got a lot to learn, and we can't let COVID-19 stop us. We cannot let them win. That being said, let's continue. Um, in For my other class that I followed, I started out all the round two of the COVID lectures with answering questions from the class because I asked people to send in questions. And so I'll do the same thing here, or at least attempt to. The difference is no one really asked me any questions about the last lecture. So I don't know if that's because everyone watched it and they totally understood and everything was fine and they're like, oh yeah, that was great. Or you guys actually didn't watch it or just didn't care enough to answer, ask, ask any questions. I don't know, but hopefully you guys are actually paying attention to the lectures and you are doing it, uh, going through the problems that I asked you to go through and actually checking that you know how to do them. Um, has been an issue with some of you uh, not trying hard enough in this class Hopefully that's not the case here. Hopefully you're going to use this time to actually catch up. Um, I did get a few questions, however, but they're not directly related to the last few lectures, but it were these were questions more or less about, um, and I won't say who was asking them. I guess if you ask a question and you actually want me to shout you out, you can actually let me know that, or you know, I can be like, hey, math student underscore 3142 asked this question, uh, shout out. Uh, whatever, but uh, unless you give me permission, I'm not. I'm gonna make the questions anonymous. So I had a couple people asking questions like, "Oh, I didn't do so well on test one. Um, is there any hope for me to?" Uh, and I, I see them saying, "Well, this particular one says, oh, I'm I'm hoping I'm trying to get a C. Is it still possible for me to come back and do that?" Um, or you know, just in general, a few students are worried about their grades. So I just want to start by addressing that. Um, so let me just say categorically, in general, this would apply to literally anybody in the class. From my perspective, it is still possible for anyone to get an A, um, not just pass, but to get an A. And from my point of view, an A is the only thing you should be aiming for. I think you aiming for a C is already kind of setting you up um, for failure or at least setting you up to not try as hard as you could be trying. Um, so what I would say is the following is that I'm not into what I know some teachers do is like, oh, if, you know, if their class doesn't perform well on an exam or they had a bunch of students not performing well on an exam, they'll give like a makeup exam or they'll give some extra credit assignments. I don't agree with that logic or that philosophy. I don't, I think that kind of gives students uh, an unhelpful and unrealistic expectation, not only for college, and I know this is just me going off very philosophical, not only for college, but for life. I mean, in life, it happens that sometimes you'll try hard, you'll work your hardest, you'll do your best, or maybe you'll know that you didn't do your best, but whatever. Uh, the day of reckoning comes and you don't perform as well as you should. Uh, you don't uh, get the result that you want. And it turns out, most of the time, pretty much all the time, you don't get a makeup, you don't get a do-over for that time. What you do have is you still have life and you still have hope. And so what you can do is you can go back to the drawing board, you can assess where things went wrong, you can assess what you could do better, uh, and you try to improve for the future. And so that's kind of how I like to think of things or how I like to do them. 
So if you are like, I don't know, training for the Olympics and you know, you go, you train really hard for four years and you go there and you don't get a medal, right? So you come here, you race and you came, came in fourth place. They don't stop it and be like, okay, let's have a do over, like, you know, cause you know, the person who came in fourth felt like they should have another shot. Like that's not how it goes. What could happen is that you can say like, okay, here are things that I could do better for next time and I'll try again down the road in another four years. So that's kind of how life happens and that's kind of how I treat the class. So I do, as I mentioned in the first, very first lecture, um, that I do take improvement into account and if say on the final, which is cumulative, in whatever form the final has to look like, I don't know yet, we'll talk about that in a little bit. If on the final, for example, let's say you do well on the topics that were on test one because those topics that were on test one will be on the final and so let's say you really bomb test one like you really like messed up if by the time the final comes around you can show me that oh now i actually know what's going on with the test one material if i read through the final i'm like hey all this stuff was on test one and they 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 killed it they got an a on all this test one material from my perspective, let's say you ended test one and you're at a D or an F. From my perspective, you're not a D or an F student anymore. You showed me at the time that you took the final that you're an A student. As far as I'm concerned, you're an A student. Me giving you a D or an F is like me judging what you were two or three months ago, which you've already been judged for that. I gave you the grade for that already. So now it's about you learning from your mistakes. If you didn't work as hard as you could have worked, you know in your heart of hearts that that's the case. Make up for it. Do better next time. If you worked hard but you still didn't get the results you want, it means that something, some way in the way you were preparing was off. Figure out what that was. Make the change and make up for it. Uh, you will have a chance to make up for things in a general, in way of improving, although I'm not going to specifically give you any um, extra credit or new assignments or have you redo test one. Um, so yeah, so that's just a general thing. Anyone can still pass a class. Anyone can still pass a class with an A. I think you should be aiming for an A. That's just my thoughts on it. Um, however, when it comes to testing, I'm not sure what that's going to look like under the circumstances, right? We're having COVID lectures. Um, so when a class that is not traditionally online, giving online or distance testing is an issue. It's not really something you can do in the same way. So a way for me to, so first of all, quizzes and tests, they're suspended indefinitely for the, the, the foreseeable future. However, we are, and by we I mean myself and the math department, we're brainstorming about how we could go about testing you guys in such a way that one is fair to you so that we do really get an accurate representation of what you know but also it maintains the integrity of the exam whereas not making any accusations against anybody but it has to be transparent, it has to be above board and we have to have a way to reasonably say yes we know that our students didn't cheat, they, they came up with this legitimately, um, they won't necessarily have more of a chance of being able to cheat than they would have if they were in here in person. And come up, coming up with such a method of testing long distance is really hard. So these are things that are still looking into. So I have no idea what the final or the second test, what form that's going to take, or even, I can't even say for sure when it's going to happen. I don't even know if the, the semester can end at the same time anymore, even though technically speaking, we only lost a couple days. Just by everything moving online, I don't know how this is going to affect the timeline for everything. So that's kind of still upping the air, but as far as you getting down on how you've performed at some point in the past, based, basically, whether or not it was on test one or it was on quizzes, stop worrying about it. Learn from what happened, learn from your mistakes, figure out what you can do better, and try again. Improve for next time. Show me that, yes, I've made mistakes, but now I'm better, I can do this, and yeah, it's all good from there as far as I'm concerned. 
Um, how, what specific form that would look like by way of showing improvement, I can't say for sure at the moment, but as soon as I come up with a good idea or the math department comes up with a good unilateral idea, I will let you guys know, of course, um, but in the, in, the, in the meantime, we don't really have a good way of administering tests. But you can improve and anyone, it's still anyone's game as far as I'm concerned. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy for everybody and I don't want you to be overly optimistic or start to overly slack off be like, oh, Javon's going to forgive me. No, Javon is going to forgive you if you improve. Um, so just make sure you improve. Do whatever it takes to actually um, do better in the future. Um, there were also questions I was supposed to meet a few people uh, this week for office hours. That obviously didn't work out. Um, so today was when um, Fordham set up Zoom accounts for the departments. And so I got a Zoom account that's going to specifically be used for Fordham business and to uh, set up office hours and things like that. That got set up today. So um, I'll be reaching out to people to see when uh, they can meet me as soon as possible. Um, at this point, just by what's going on, I don't think it's super duper important to have uh, that any meetings before the end of spring break, although I'm more than willing to, during spring break, meet with people over online through Zoom, but I think we have some time. So I'll be reaching out to people who've made appointments with me prior to that, and I'll be able to actually officially schedule office hours now. Um, yeah, so I'll keep you abreast of that. But that's basically it. No one asked me any specific questions. So I'm going to assume that you guys understood everything I spoke about last time, and it's just now to move on to bigger and better things. Um, so what I wanted to talk about uh, now was uh, estimating series. So that's the next topic we're going into. So, we have been covering over the past few classes what a series is, the sum of the terms of a sequence, uh, what an infinite series is, the sum of the terms of an infinite sequence, and what a series converges to. That means if we were to add up an infinite number of things that have a certain format, what, uh, how do we know that it's going to add up to something meaningful that makes sense mathematically? So we spoke about that, and we also went through the convergence test we went through several tests, went through 10 of them. You know, we know about telescoping series, test for divergence, P-series test, integral test, uh, comparison test in the direct and limit comparison variety, ratio test, the root test. Uh, we look at the alternating series test, the absolute convergence test. We looked at a lot of tests. Um, one thing you should know is that two of these tests, only two of them, can tell you what a series converges to, namely the geometric series test. I didn't mention that last time. Uh, just now. But the geometric series test was another one. It actually told you when a geometric series converges and exactly what it converged to. Another test that we know is the telescoping series test. That one also, at the end of that process, you will not only know that something converges, you'll know what it converges to. None of the other tests have that though. Um, they can tell you that the series ends up adds up to something meaningful, but they can't tell you what that thing is. They can just tell you that it happened. And they can tell you either in, in an absolute convergence sense, we spoke about that, or a conditionally convergent sense. Um, so remember, absolute convergence just means the series converges if I put absolute values around all the terms. This is super important because this maintains commutativity of addition for infinite series. So if I have an infinite sum, how I know it will always add up to the same thing if I rearrange the terms is it has to be absolutely convergent. If it's conditionally convergent, meaning it does not converge with absolute values, but it converges without them, then I could rearrange the terms and get a different answer, and this have, has very detrimental consequences for calculus. Uh, so some tests, like the ratio test and the root test, give you absolute convergence right off the bat. The other ones, you have to specifically put in the absolute values to figure that out. The alternating series test can never tell you about absolute convergence, by the way. It can only tell you about conditional. So if you have to test for absolute convergence, uh, don't use the alternating series test. It's not going to work out. Um, but yeah, so last time we spoke about, we finished up with the root test. 
Uh, prior to that, we spoke about strategies for applying tests. Then we spoke about how to actually test a series for absolute versus conditional versus divergence. Um, and we did some examples. We did four examples. Um, so now we want to address the question of, OK, I have a series, and I know that it converges through some test. How do I know what it converges to is the question. So this comes down to estimating series, because it turns out finding out what sum, sum infinite series a n converges to, find out what it converges to, is difficult in general, very hard. Um, most of uh, the techniques for actually determining uh, this, the answer to this question is beyond the Calc 2 pay grade. Uh, uh, it's difficult in general. Uh, best we can do is approximate the answer. Right? So I have a series, I know it converges, uh, but it's not a geometric or a telescoping series, I don't know what it converges to. How do I know what it converges to? Well, if you're a Calc 2 student, chances are you're out of luck, you're never going to know what it converges to. Not exactly. However, what we do know how to do is to estimate the series. We will be able to approximate what it converges to, to within some tolerance. So we won't necessarily be able to find the answer, but we will be able to find some number and be able to tell roughly how close to the answer that number is. And that's called estimating series. So actually finding out what a series converges to is actually super important, not only for math, but for lots of applications. Series are actually very important, not only for calculus, but in general, in engineering and in physics and in a lot of applied sciences, um, you need to do series. Your TI-89, for heaven's sake, most of the things that your TI-89 can do or any calculator can do, it uses series at the end of the day uh, to actually get those things done. So figuring out what series converges to is a very important question. Um, most of the time, though, we can't do it, not with the knowledge of only calculus 2. So what we can do is approximate the answer. And I mentioned this before, that might sound like a cop-out to a lot of people, but approximation is where it's at, actually. When it comes to actually applying anything that we know, sometimes the theoretically exact answer isn't something that we can use in real life anyway, because in real life, we approximate things all the time. When your computer tells you an answer for something, uh, usually that answer itself is an approximation, because if you had to use pi or e or some irrational number, your computer cannot write down all the digits for this. It approximates it. So in real life, we do approximations all the time. Most of what we get done, 99.99999% of it, is an approximation in the first place. So don't feel bad that we can only get an approximation. Uh, it's actually a really good thing that we can get an approximation. And most of the time, even if we could get the exact answer, we won't be able to use it anyway. So an approximation is going to be good enough for most things. So now the question is, how do we approximate the answer? And the answer to the infinite series question is by using partial sums. So remember what a partial sum is. It was just the sum of the first few terms of a series. So I can talk about the tenth partial sum of the series. And what that means is I add up the first 10 terms of the series, and that's just a finite number of terms. I'll be able to do this. And so what we can do is we can just add up a first few terms of a series, and then the question is we want to ask ourselves is, how close are we to the answer now? Because we know for a series to converge, the terms have to approach zero, which means there comes a point where the thing we're adding is so small that it's going to make a very small difference to what the actual answer is. So we don't need to actually add up as many terms as we might think. So the idea is, if I know I added up a certain number of terms, how can I determine how close I am to the actual answer as if I were to add up all infinite number of terms? Versus another dimension that we'd want to know is, 
if I already know how close to the answer I want to be, how can I figure out how many terms do I need to add to get that close to the answer? So we're going to actually answer those two questions, not in all contexts, but in some really important ones and the ones that uh, I'll probably test you on. Um, so that is what estimating series is about. Finding out what specifically a series converges to in general is a very difficult question to answer. So we're going to approximate the answer. We're going to use partial sums and then we're going to have theorems that tell us, okay, this, if we take this partial sum, it'll be this close to the answer. Um, and that is basically it. Now, to introduce some terminology that I'm going to be using, Let's just actually talk about that terminology. So let's say this guy, A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus dot, 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 is an infinite series. We know about that already. Now, Sn is if I add up the first n terms of this series, so a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot 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 plus a n minus 1 plus a n, right? So that's going to be a finite sum of terms. There are n things that I'm adding together here. A human being can do this given enough time. A computer can do it given a lot less time. But this is something that can be doable. It's a process that will terminate. We won't be doing it forever. This is called the end partial sum. So you add the first n terms of the series. Right? Now, let's suppose s is what the series converges to. So let's suppose s. This is the what a n converges to. Uh, we define another term here, which we call Rn. This is going to be uh, the difference between S and the nth partial sum. This is called, by the way, the remainder term. So pretty much the difference between that and the, the rest. So basically what the remainder term is, it's the tail. It's everything else after this. So this would be a n plus 1 plus a n plus 2 plus dot dot dot. And it gives you the entire infinite tail. This is called the remainder term for a series. So you have an infinite series a n. It's just you adding up an infinite number of terms. You adding up the first n terms is what we call the nth partial sum. Now, if this whole thing equals s, s is what the series converges to, then if I take the difference between that and I subtract uh, the partial sums, I'm left over with the tail, and this tail is called the remainder term. It's what remains after I subtract the partial sums. Now, of course, this guy here refers to the difference between the series value and the nth partial sum. In other words, this is the guy that's going to tell us how far away we are from the actual answer. Okay? So, if we do want to approximate what a series is doing, what we're going to want to do is figure out a way to talk about this Rn. So I'm stepping out of the camera here so you can have some time to copy the notes. I'd say pause the video right now and you can copy all those down, um, but then I'm going to move on. Okay. So, um, now, there is no broad categorical works in all cases way to talk about the Rn. It will depend on the actual uh, series that you're looking at. It will depend also on the series test that you are doing. So, um, 
how we understand Rn will depend on the series and test being used. So the test is the, the guys I was talking about before. Right? Whether you're using the geometric series test or the alternating series test or blah, 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 whatever tests are being used, that's how we're going to understand how to talk about the remainder term. So let's, uh, I'm going to talk about the remainder term in a few cases uh, because some of them are too complicated. But these guys, I think, are simple enough for you to understand and they're also short enough for me to test you on this idea um, whenever we know what a test might look like. Um, so let's talk about uh, one. Now, this one I like because it's, it's very easy to digest, I think, and it's, it's also something that's commonly tested. Not only do I test my students on this a lot, but a lot of other calculus classes, calculus teachers will actually test their students on this. And it's the, uh, the alternating series test. The alternating series approximation theorem. Okay. As the name suggests, it applies to alternating series. So, uh, how can we approximate uh, the, the value of an alternating series? Here's what the theorem says. Uh, suppose. Suppose this is an alternating series, right? Some given alternating series going from uh, n equals 0 to infinity or whatever, 1 into infinity. An infinite series is alternating. Then, here is the surprising result. The magnitude of the remainder term, which we can think of that as just the difference between the actual value of the sum and the nth partial sum, if I were to add up the first n terms, how far is that? What's the difference between that in magnitude and the actual answer? It turns out for an alternating series test, it will always be less than or equal to, get this, the n plus first term. Now remember in an alternating series, we assume that all these guys are positive numbers. So this is some magnitude. The magnitude of the n plus first term actually tells you how close the first n terms will get you to the actual answer. Now, that is a surprisingly beautiful and simplistic result. Um, of course, I'm not going to prove it to you, even though the proof is actually not that bad. Uh, but that's just something to know. I'll give you time to pause the video and copy that down. But yeah, that's the, uh, the alternating series approximation theorem. In other words, we can approximate how close we are to the actual answer um, by just looking at the very next term. So basically that means if I were to add up the first 10 terms, the magnitude of the 11th term will tell me how close I am to the actual answer. If I were to add up the first 1,000 terms, the 1,001st term is going to tell me how close I am to the actual answer. This is true for alternating series. This is not true in general. This is true for alternating series. Okay. So that's not something that will work in general. It'll work for this particular kind of series though, which is uh, pretty nice. Uh, let me just give you a very simple, we're going to do more examples later on after we talk about power series, but let me just give you a, a quick example right now, right off the bat, so you can kind of see what I mean or what I'm talking about. Um, so let's use an old example. We saw that the alternating harmonic series Converge. In fact, we know it converges conditionally. Right? So when I was telling you guys about alternating series test, I used this example to demonstrate to you uh, applying the alternating series test. Right? So we know this converges, we know it converges conditionally, because if we were to put absolute values around this, 
that gives us the series of 1 over n, which we know is harmonic, that diverges. It's also a divergent p-series. Um, so this, we know, uh, that converges absolutely. So here's the question. How good an approximation is S4? So let's say someone went and decided to add up the first four terms of this series. How good an approximation is that? Meaning, how close to the answer would they be? Um, so, meaning, if I were to take S4, which is minus one plus a half minus a third plus a fourth, that is equal to, put everyone over, 12 is the LCD, minus 12 plus 6 minus 4 plus 3, that's minus 16 plus 9 minus 7 over 12, that's minus 7 over 12, right? So what I can think of that minus 7 over 12 as is an approximation for this series, right? I just added up the first four terms. Now, of course, the more terms I add, the closer I get to what the answer is in general. But how good is adding up these four terms is the question. Um, so, by the alternating series approximation theorem, The remainder term, right, meaning the difference between the actual answer and those terms I just uh, set up to do is less than or equal to A5. Now what is A5? Well that's the fifth term. What would the fifth term have been? Uh, well, it would have been one-fifth, right? Now, yes, it would have been minus one-fifth, but remember, the minus came from the minus one to the end part. It, it's not attached. The a parts themselves, these are always positive. In other words, i.e., minus seven over 12 is within one-fifth, which is point zero, point two, point two of the actual answer. which is crazy, but a good kind of crazy, you know? Um, so if I were to add up the first four terms of this particular alternating series, it turns out that I would be within 0.2 of the actual answer. Meaning if I were to add up an infinite number of terms, the answer I would get at the end of the day is going to actually, I, I'm mixing up, uh, where am I, where am I, where am I? This is actually harder than it looks because I'm looking at the camera while trying to... So this answer <laughs> is actually uh, 0.2 from the actual answer, which meaning uh, if I were to add up an infinite number of terms, then the actual answer is going to be minus 7 over 12, either plus 0.2 or minus 0.2. It'll be somewhere in that window. It, that, so the most it will be off by is 0.2, which is pretty neat. At least I think so. So whatever alternating series you're looking at, um, the very next term tells you how close the sum of the previous terms is to the actual answer. So if someone gives you a partial sum, you can know how close that would be to the actual answer. That's pretty cool. Um, on top of that, so let's say we, instead we don't have a particular partial sum, but let's say we wanted a certain partial sum. So again, given this guy, we might ask this question. Um, how many terms would I need to add in order to get a certain distance away from the actual answer? So let, let's ask it this way. Given this, how many terms are needed Approximate the sum to within 
zero, zero, 001 accuracy. Okay, so let's say I'm in a situation where I have machinery or whatever that's only measuring things correct up to two decimal places. What if I just wanted to make sure that we're okay up to three decimal places? Um, how many terms would I need to add of this guy to get this close to the actual answer? That is the question that we are going to answer now. That is the question. Okay. So here's how we would do it. Uh, based on the alternating series theorem, alternating series test approximation theorem, uh, what I would say is, pause the video right now, pause it, pause it. I'm going to give you three seconds to pause it. Three, two, one. OK, pause it. Oh, well, oh. unpause, unpause. OK, so I'm going to tell you to pause it. When I tell you to pause it, what I want you to do is pause and actually try to answer this question before I tell you what the answer is. OK, all right, three, two, one, pause. OK, we're back. So hopefully you tried to answer this. Um, because if you did bad on test one and you want to improve, this is a very important part of the process, actually trying to do problems on your own before Javon tells you how to do the problems. It's going to be one of the, the most important things you can do in, um, in trying to improve. And not just for me, for anyone. Before you just run to look at the solutions to anything, or run to ask someone for help, or run to ask someone else for a question, actually stop and try to do it on your own. You'll be surprised. A lot of times, once you force your brain to start working on problems, it'll get better at working on the problems. You'll be surprised after a while of doing this, how you start figuring things out after a while. Secondly, even if you try to do the problem yourself and you don't get to the answer, at the very least, what that's going to do for you is it's going to tell you where you're stuck and why. What exactly is it that you don't understand? So when you run to someone else for help, like you come to me during office hours or whatever, you'd be able to say, hey, I got up to this point. I get stuck at this step specifically. What should I do to get over that hurdle? And it helps the person who's trying to help you help you better. And it, it helps you to know that when you do see solutions from someone else, you'll know exactly what point of those solutions was a sticking point for you, and that will help you kind of clear up and give you some idea, and then you can do another problem to, to see if you really understand. But really, only what you can do by on your own counts. Me doing a problem for you does not count. That's very important. So hopefully you actually tried this. So again, what we do here is use the alternating series approximation theorem. be less than or equal to the n plus first term. So if I want my remainder to be less than this, all I need to do is to make sure that this term is less than that. We need a n plus 1 to be less than or equal to point zero, zero 0.01. That's what we need. As long as I can find the, the term in the series that is less than 0 0.001, then n is the number of terms I would need to actually get to within that answer. But what is the a n plus 1? So from this guy here, this is the series of minus 1 to the n, 1 over n. So if I think of that in the format as minus 1 to the n, a n, then my a n is actually this. So here I know that my a n is 1 over n. So what is a n plus 1? Remember how we can, this is just a sequence, how we think of sequences as functions. So I'm just plugging in the input now, n plus 1, instead of just n. So this means I need 1 over n plus 1. And I need to solve that inequality. So both of these guys are positive. I can take reciprocals. Um, that will give me a thousand. And so my n needs to be greater than or equal to 999. This is the number of terms needed. Okay. 
not in general, for this particular alternating series. Of course, if the formula for an was different, your n value needed would also be different. But for this particular series, if I want to get to within 0 0.001 of the actual answer, I need to add up 999 terms. Or, of course, ask a, ask a computer to add up 999 terms. So that's actually uh, your answer. The more, the farther you go above 999 terms is the closer you get to the answer. But at 999, you will be about, you will be within a window. Not exactly 0 0.001 away, but the max, your window of error will be 0 0.001. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's that. That's the alternating series approximation theorem, which is pretty nice, pretty easy. The alternating series is nice in the sense that um, whenever you add up the first n terms, the magnitude of the n plus first term, the magnitude of the very next term, tells you how close you are to the actual answer. How much time? Well, we don't have a lot of time left. Wow. Uh, answering those questions at the beginning took longer than I thought. OK, let's move on. Another one that we want to talk about is, we're going to skip the ratio test, by the way. The, the, there is a, a way to estimate the ratio test and the root test, but they're, it's very complicated. I don't actually want us to worry about that. I think the other situation I want you to know about is the integral test and the comparison test. So. So, assume you just determined that a series converges using the integral test. know how to approximate it with the nth partial sum. It turns out that the remainder term, the nth remainder term, so remember what that is. I add up the first n terms, then I measure, I subtract that from what the actual answer for the series is. That gives me rn. It turns out I can talk about an upper bound for this. Uh, the tail is going to be less than or equal to this integral. n to infinity. So let's say I'm doing this just to make it precise. Just say from 0 to infinity. Could be from 1 to infinity or whatever. But it's going to be from n to infinity where n is the same as this guy. Of f of x dx. Uh, where f of x equals a sub x. So remember, to apply the integral test, what you had to do is you thought of a n as a function, and if it was continuous, positive, or non-negative, and decreasing, then you could actually compute an integral, the integral from 0 to infinity, of that function. And if that integral converges, the series would actually converge. So I'm saying that same formula that you integrated do that integral not on the entire interval, but from the nth point to that. So if you wanted to know uh, the fifth partial sum, you would integrate from 5 to infinity. If you wanted to know about the 15th partial sum, you'd integrate from 15 to infinity. If you wanted to know about the 1,000th partial sum, uh, integrate from 1,000 to infinity. Right? So that will actually be an upper bound for your remainder term. It turns out for this test, we also know a lower bound. The integral from n plus 1 to infinity will actually be smaller than the remainder. So I can actually tell you a, a range where these guys are. Right? And that, 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 is the, uh, that is the theorem that allows us to approximate the integral test. Uh, by the way, this means 
that the integral from n plus 1 to infinity of our function Now, of course, it makes sense that this one is smaller than that. Hopefully, you realize that because if I'm measuring an area starting at n plus 1 versus starting at n, the guy at n plus 1 is smaller than the guy starting at n, right? So n, the area from n onwards is going to include the area from n plus 1 onwards. So the area from n plus 1 to infinity is going to be smaller than the area from n to infinity in general. Um, the remainder is going to be in between these two. What I wanted to flesh out for you again is that the remainder is actually s minus sn. And so basically what that means is that the actual answer, right, so this is the actual sum, it is going to be between the integral from n to infinity of f plus sn, which means the first few n terms that you added up, uh, and it's going to be between n plus 1 and infinity of f plus sn. Um, this is actually going to give you a window. It now creates an interval. This is going to give you a number plus this number. That's the lower bound, the left bound for the interval. This is an integral is going to give you a number plus that's going to give you an upper bound for the interval. So you have a left end point and a right end point for the window. And what you can do is you can just keep making this guy computing more terms to make the window even smaller. Let's uh, do an example here. So copy that down. You copied it? Okay. If not, just rewind the video and pause it and copy it down. Example. Uh, we saw this integral converges by integral test. Okay, so that was my example for the integral test. A good uh, an approximation is let's say S5, right? So S5 here uh, would be, of course, you plug in 1 for n, get e over 1, plus you plug in 2 for n, e to the 1 half over 4, plug in 3 for n, e to the 1 third over 9, plug in 4 for n, e to the 1 fourth over 16, plug in 5 for n, e to the 1 fifth over 25, right? How good an approximation is that for the entire uh, series? So, what you can notice here is that uh, R5, right, the tail after this, all the sum of the terms after this, is going to be less than or equal to the integral from 5 to infinity of our function. By the way, this is, of course, remember how you would integrate this, we would use actually substitution, u equals 1 over x, so your d would be minus 1 over x squared. So this is minus e to the 1 over x between 5 and infinity. And yes, technically we should write an n here and that limit as n approaches infinity. But you, you guys all know that deal. Uh, Infinity goes in here, you get 0 for the power, so you get e to the 0 minus 1. Um, 5 uh, goes in here, so you get plus e to the 1 fifth. And that's, uh, that's the answer. Let's actually rock me. What is that roughly? Do I have to on this calculator? Yes. So 
that's roughly point zero point two two one four. So us adding up the first five terms of this particular series gets us this close to the actual answer. In fact, uh, if you did six instead, so S here is going to be between S5 plus 0.2214. If you plugged in 6 instead of 5, which is the n plus 1 at the bottom, get 0.181. So S5 plus 0.181. So your actual answer is within this window. Um, just an FYI, but this is probably the answer that I would want on a test. Just tell me what the upper bound is. That's how close you are. One last scenario, and I'll just describe what this is to you, because it's going to be very similar to this, um, so I won't have to actually do an example, is with the comparison test. similar thing you're doing an improper integral here, but your f of x is actually the formula corresponding to the p-series. This one is nice. It's kind of exactly the same as the previous theorem, um, because you might recall that the comparison theorem has an analogous representation in, for improper integrals, and the integral test kind of applies to the comparison theorem for the comparison test for series, so that actually makes sense. Um, ba, 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 where f is the formula corresponding to the n. So, for example, did I give an example? Do I want to give an example? Do we have time for an example? Uh, we're actually a little over time. Um, let's see my notes here. Uh, let's say you had the series n plus 1 over nq plus 1. You go from 1 to infinity. Then, what you would do is you would actually compare this uh, to 1 over n squared, and you determine that that would actually converge. And basically then, what the idea is, you'd be able to conclude that the remainder term is going to be less than or equal to the integral from n to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. So it, it falls uh, right in line with the integral test. Um, very similar, actually. 
you might recall that we use the integral test to prove the P-series test. And the integral test uh, is kind of in the background for the comparison theorems because the comparison theorems, we got them, the idea for them, from the fact that we had theorems about comparison from the improper integrals. And we can know, the integral test tells us we can use improper integrals to talk about series. And so you, the, imp the integral test is at work here as well. That being said, we're going to stop there for today. So we learned to, and that, that's all I want to do on estimating series. The main ideas that you want to take away is knowing what series converge to is important. However, we do not have all the tools to be able to do that yet. The best we can do is approximate how close we are to the actual answer by adding up the first few terms. We went over how to determine this. You, if we're looking at an alternating series. We also know how to determine this if we use the integral test to determine convergence. How good is the integral test in getting us to the answer here? And we look at the comparison test. Um, particularly in the P-series case, because in more difficult cases, you probably won't have a nice integral. But if you actually use a P-series, which very often for the comparison test, you do use a P-series, um, this is kind of how you do it. You pretty much use a 1 over x to the P integral did I even point out the right thing on the camera? Can't even see. You would use uh, this integral to talk about how far you are from the actual answer. So we'll wrap up there today. Um, as I said, hopefully you watched this, hopefully you paid attention, hopefully you paused the video and tried problems when I asked you to do it. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section. If you want to be a little bit more anonymous, you can message me directly through Jupiter Grades. Uh, because I want to make sure I don't miss any questions. It's a very stressful, difficult time, and emails uh, to my college email are just it's crazy. I'm getting like 10 emails an hour or something. It's, it's crazy. I don't know if it's 10 an hour specifically, but it's a lot. Like, I have a lot of unread messages now, and it's just it's hard to keep up with them all. Um, so, leave me questions uh, how I ask. I will see you guys in the next video. In the next video, we're going to talk about power series. Very, very, very super important topic. Um, it's us applying series specifically to calculus, and we're going to use power series to apply to integrals as well. Power series is going to be the next topic, so you can look into that ahead of time if you'd like. Um, but in the meantime, check out my last lecture that I posted. Check out this lecture. Have any questions, get them to me ASAP. Uh, I will post one more lecture for this week because we really should have had two lectures and we've, we really should have three lectures and this is going to be the second one this week. I'll post one tomorrow. Technically, spring break begins on Monday if I'm not mistaken, so until then, uh, ask me questions before Monday is all I ask and uh, I'll deal with those in the next video. And like I said, I'll be reaching out to anyone who needs to meet with me for office hours. We will do it through Zoom. So I'm not going to have you guys come in even, even though technically I could. But, you know, just to make sure everyone's safe, uh, that's what we'll do. So we'll sign in. That's all we have for today. Uh, signing off. This is Javon for the COVID lectures. I'll see you guys around.